Hi everyone, this is Daniela Camboni reporting from Colorado Springs. Well, folks, I don't need to tell you that stocks are at all time highs. It's textbook bubble behavior, and it's why my colleague Joel Lippman is stepping forward with the biggest warning of his career. The next crash is underway for a specific reason that almost no one is paying attention to. He's issuing a rare recommendation to put nearly everything into a completely different approach. The one the rich have used to make a fortune in every crisis for decades. It's not gold or anything else you've likely considered. Joel will go live on Wednesday, September 27th with all the details, so you will not want to miss it. Head to September27warning.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates. Again, that's September27warning.com. It's 100% free. Now back to the Daniela Camboni Show. Welcome, everyone. Hope you're enjoying lunch. Our three panelists, without going into too much detail, three titans of the industry, Pierre Lasson, Frank Justra, Robert Friedland. We have 40 minutes, so I hope to get in everything uh, that I want to get in. So it's the ultimate gold panel. So let's start by taking a general overview of this gold market, because people will come up to me and say, Daniela, how are you still covering gold? Gold is so boring. It's a barbaric relic. It has done nothing this year. It has paled in comparison to equities. But if we take a step back, is this a just label for an asset that's been holding above 1900? Pierre, let's start with you. Well, thank you, Daniela. And uh, I welcome uh, my dear friend here um, at the end of the panel here. I hope you, uh, he's a born again Goldian, aren't you? A, a born again Goldian. Yeah. You, you, uh, would you recognize what it looks like? <laughs> All right. Um, this year will be the best year ever for the gold price for the miners. They are taking full advantage of that. If you look at their cash flow, it's the best ever. They're um, doing actually better than uh, the copper mining companies. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, but it's not reflected in the, in the stock price. There's complete total disinterest at the equity level. Uh, the uh, portfolio managers are just like gone on holiday. Robert, you've had an interesting relationship with gold. So what's your, what's your take on gold now? Well, the only thing we know for sure is that the price of it will fluctuate, but it's priced in dollars. And we're near the end of interest rate rises from the Fed because there's an election coming next year that's unpredictable. So the gold price is up, what, 40% in yen. It's up in a lot of the world sees a massive increase in gold in the last 12 months. So as soon as uh, we stop raising rates, you should see a very attractive move in gold and all metals. Of course. Frank? Well... It was interesting, there was a paper the IMF just put out that says gold, a barbaric relic no more. And I think that uh, people are coming to the realization that gold is really the ultimate store of value. And I, and I think if you look at it from the perspective, and I, I treat gold separately than I treat gold mining stocks, but if I look at my, my physical gold position, it's just there for, as a store of value. And I believe that um, this de-dollarization that's happening, that's taking place, is going to continue to chip away at the value of the U.S. dollar. And as we're all, we always follow gold in dollar terms, but if you really want to know the true value of gold, you have to look at what happens in places like Argentina, where gold has gone up tenfold in the last three years, or Turkey, where it's gone up two, uh, threefold, fivefold in the last three years, or even Japan, where it's doubled in the last year. So I believe that the U.S. dollar is the ultimate fiat currency that's going to come down in value against real things, and that will, when that happens, you'll see the true reflection of what, why gold is so valuable to whom. And on the flip side, I mean, last week we saw the attention about China premiums and how the appetite perhaps here in North America has waned, but it's strong, it's alive in China. I mean, what should we be reading into with, with that? Um, China is uh, a physical market, just like India, and it's half the gold market, period. Uh, they've opened a, uh, the Shanghai Exchange has been open now for uh, a certain time, and they trade physical gold. 
Um, however, it's nothing anywhere near the NYMEX, and as long as the NYMEX is still the number one gold market in the world, I think you're going to have um, sort of like an orderly market, but the minute that the Shanghai exchange becomes the bigger market, and it will likely happen, it's going to become a casino. Uh, and there's a propensity for casino making prices at that point in time. Well, let, let's dive a little deeper there. What is the, you, you say it's going to happen. How far away are we from that reality? I think you're looking at probably uh, five years before we see that. And then how does it impact us? Well, at, at that point in time, you could see gold prices in like, you know, crazy numbers, like up to 20,000 possibly. I mean, like, because it's going to become a casino. Well, I, you know, listen, China has, and I've been watching this very closely. If you think since 1995, 46,000 tons has moved from the west to the east. Um, China is the largest gold producer, the largest gold importer. It doesn't allow the export of gold mined in China. And I think there is a purpose behind all of this gold that's flowing into China. And I truly believe that the 2,100 tons that they've reported as their official reserves are way understated. And we're going to find out soon enough when they feel like divulging what they really own, there will be a purpose to them coming forward with whatever they own, but I believe that they have a lot more gold than they're currently declaring, and there's a purpose to that. Frank, I know you've been tracking the China gold buying and basically all of central bank buying. Um, that's just been on, on an uptrend, and that's really at the crux of your thesis of why you should be owning gold. But if we're looking at why China keeps accumulating or why they're revealing their, their facts now, I mean, what do you, what do you think's the master plan here? Well, I'm one of those few people that believe that there will be a restructuring of the global monetary system and that, and that gold will play a role. Now, whether that's, it's, it's impossible to know which way that's going to play out, whether there's going to be a BRICS plus currency or whether the Chinese will try and back the yuan with gold um, in order, and this is backing it for with the purpose of using the yuan or this new BRICS currency as a settlement currency for trade as opposed to a reserve currency. So I believe, if you look at what's happening, all the buying that the central banks have conducted over the last 13 years at an accelerating pace has been the BRICS plus the BRICS plus countries that have just joined or wanting to join, plus the applicants. They're the ones that are buying all of this gold. And you have to ask yourself, why? Now, there are obviously a lot, could be a lot of reasons, but I believe that we're heading into a new monetary system, that gold will play some role. I'm so happy you brought this up, and I want to go there. But Robert, anything to add on China and gold that you find interesting? Or I actually agree with Frank. It's really very simple. Um, uh, we have... Um, a very high probability of an alternative currency to the dollar. Uh, when they had the BRIC meeting, you had about 40% of humanity there looking for an alternative to the dollar. And they're really working on it. It's likely to be backed by precious metals and base metals in an in a, in a actual basket. I, I've been in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia 10 times in the last year. The Saudis were invited into BRICS. Sir Ramaphosa, who uh, hosted that, was on our board for 19 years. There's a very, very active effort for about half of humanity to break the dollar, just to get off the dollar. And, and so the dollar will fail a lot like a bridge fails. A bridge fails very, very slowly, then all of a sudden, boom. So there's a lot of cracks in the dollar. Right now, we've had this psychedelic increase in M1 in the last two years. It was just like crazy increase in money supply. I mean, just really crazy. If you look at the chart. And so, um, the U.S. government right now is paying a trillion dollars a year in interest since the Fed rose rates to 5%. That's really a lot of money in interest. So we have to get through this uh, very entertaining election that's going to happen. We have very profound problems in American society. Everybody's like uh, bad-mouthing the Chinese and pointing to all, this, all these problems in China continuously. I've been in China. It's, it's much more complicated than the situation looks. Actually, the contradictions we have with our upcoming elections. Just take a look at the United Auto Workers. 
They want a 40 percent increase in, in pay to make automobiles. So do you think we can really compete with China in electric cars? So we have a very, very complicated situation coming where it does make sense to have a significant exposure to precious metal. It's very simple. Yeah, yeah right? very interesting, but um, I don't agree. You don't want to hear it? Yeah, well, the, the U.S. dollar is Tina. There is no alternative. Um, well, they're if you working wanna, on it. No, they're working now, on it. The, you, know? you know, let me go. I, I think okay. that the central banks, at, at the margin, the central banks are switching their reserve from dollars to gold. At the margin. I mean, it's happening. We see it. Like, for the last five years, the central banks have been buyer. And last year, they bought, like, over 1,200 ton of gold, which is a quarter of all. No, it's, uh, it's almost a third of all production for last year. So, significant. Um, but I don't think that um, if uh, the um, uh, Beijing comes up with a yuan-backed gold, why would you buy that? They can take that gold reserve out of your account in a second, and you have nothing. Nobody's going to go for it that way, okay? Nobody's going to have the confidence that your money is going to be in a safe place. Same thing if it happens with uh, Brazil. I mean, have you ever got your money out of Brazil? No. Um, I think that the best alternative is probably what the WGC is working on right now, which is essentially gold ETF 2.0, which is a digital gold currency that's going to be backed by the largest banks in the world and with the stamp of the WGC, and that is a, a digitized currency. And that has the hallmark of something that could be the competition worldwide for the, for, uh, the dollar. So I want to address what you both said. First of all, I think, Pierre, I think it's really, and I'll really agree with Robert on this, I think it's the height of Western arrogance to believe that when 80% of the world wants to see a change in the monetary system, that they won't eventually get it. It's not 1945 any longer. The, world, the U.S. does not have, the, have half the world's gold reserves and half the world's GDP. It's a different world. And I think it's quite smug of people like Larry Summers to say, well, where are they going to move to if they don't have the dollar? Or Buffett saying they have no choice. Or that guy from Goldman Sachs ridiculing the idea by saying that uh, it's ridiculous and embarrassing that, to even consider a BRICS currency. I think that's the height of arrogance. And I think, you remember Ken Rogoff's book about uh, this time is different, 800 years of folly. Uh, and. Every generation, every power, every paper currency that comes to pass and fails, it's, they make the same mistakes. And the United States is right now, I think, being very smug on the outside, but being very concerned on, on the inside. And if you, you, all you have to see is the media attack recently. This is the point that Robert pointed out. How the media, the U.S. media, is now uh, is attacking the idea of a BRICS currency, attacking... Um, China, anything that China does, as, you know, that they're not trustworthy. But it, behind the scenes, they're scrambling now to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative. They're scrambling to compete with the new development bank set up in China with the BRICS that's now competing with the World Bank. They're scrambling to make the World Bank, uh, uh, sorry, they're scrambling to address these uh, contingent reserve arrangements that China has, and these swap lines that China has with 40 countries, which are all designed to take on Western institutions, um, create a new financial system, so it will be a bifurcated financial system. And, and, and they're scrambling. You saw it, they announced the Zambia, Angola, DRC deal the other day, to, you know, the, in the Middle East Belt and Road Initiative, going through from India through the Middle East to Europe. So they are they are concerned, and I think they should be concerned, because, and to, and I'm not talking, you were addressing reserve currencies. What you have to think about this is as a trade settlement currency, and one way it could manifest itself is that you have all these central bank digital currencies now being created. What is it, 130 of them, 130 countries? Why not back those with gold? And then it's a central bank to central bank FX, clearing system that can be settled with gold every quarter or some other mechanism. All I'm trying to say, Pierre, is that I think there are mechanisms out there, and 
you're already seeing all these bilateral trade agreements between countries, France and China, Indonesia and South Korea, Malaysia and India. And there, every day you see a new bilateral trade agreement that says we're only going to trade in our local currencies. If that doesn't chip away at the U.S. dollar, what right. will? I mean, that's, it's going to happen. It might take some time, but Fra it will happen. Frank, you know the pushback on this is that people are going to say, but Frank, we've been hearing this since 1953. I mean, is the U.S. Obvious, um, obviously, they're watching this. They must be talking about it. I mean, even Yellen finally hinted at some sort of, yeah, perhaps we're going to lose some power here. So they must have tools in their toolkit to be prepared and fight back. Sticks and carrots. And that's, there was an article in Business Insider the other day, was an opinion piece, that it was urging the U.S. to use sticks and carrots, carrots to counter this China, basically China offensive that China's trying to change the world financial order. And so they can use the carrots, as we talked about, or you know, trying to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative, loosening up the World Bank for additional infrastructure loans, all sorts of things. And the sticks, they're gonna start threatening you know, trade agreements like the GS G7 has already, U.S. has already suggested, I think it was to Turkey or the UAE, that, you know, if they don't play ball on the Russian sanctions, they will be excluded from G7 markets. Let's play out the scenario that the U.S. dollar does get dethroned. Who wins, who loses? <laughs> um, if you add up all the... Uh, GDP of all the African countries, they still don't come up to Germany. So like when you look at the trade numbers, it's still very, very on the outcome, on the margin. You're not talking big numbers. The reality is that the US dollars is still TINA. There's no alternative in the long run. What you're looking at is margin stuff. It's not gonna help very much. But when you look at the US, $1.6 trillion deficit this year, okay? 6% of GDP. Back in 1976, the gold price would have shut up $100, like just on that news. Um, and then you look at next year, it's not gonna get any better. You look at all of the European countries, they're all in the same boat. Japan, it's even worse. So at the end of the day, who's gonna be the big winner? It's gonna be gold, because gold is in a long-term bull market. And when you look at the debt being accumulated, unserviceable at 5% interest rate, like what, the, the, the countries, they have only two alternatives. Either they go into depression or they depreciate their currency. Those are the only two alternatives. Will the politician throw the economy into a depression? Don't think so. They want to get reelected. But, but getting back to your original point, Pierre, about, you know, it's not going to just be China or Brazil, but, you know, looking at the BRICS, they are looking at a gold-backed currency. They've now added six other nations, 20 other invasions are... 20 other nations are begging to be invited to the table. I mean, they're, they're, they're gaining force here. Yeah, but it's, it, at the, it's at the margin. Who's the biggest buyer of goods in the world, like the United States? They want to get paid in, you know, the, the people who are selling, buying, they're being paid in U.S. dollars. Europe wants to get paid in euro and U.S. dollars. Uh, so when you're looking at the margin, yes, it's happening. The U.S. dollar, if you look at the, the percent of U.S. dollar in reserve, I think it used to be, you know, like 68, 70%. 70 percent. It's down to what now? 58. There you go, 58 percent. So it is happening, but it's not going to go to zero anytime soon. But I think you're missing the point. I think you keep focusing on the reserves. Re you got to think about these new mechanisms for trading, settlement on trading, and that's where I think it's going to be chipping away at the value of the dollar. You mentioned central bank digital currencies, 130 out of 190, you know, working on a pilot project, planning to roll out central bank digital currencies. I mean, it is coming to a theater near you. I want to know from the panelists, how many of you are thinking about this? Are you concerned about privacy? Or do you think it's just something we're naturally going to flow into? What's your take, Robert, on central bank digital currencies? The situation is hopeless. It's not serious. I never think about this. I'm having an out-of-body experience sitting here with all these gold bugs, wondering why we're even having this discussion. We need to mine gold and store it. It's clearly a source of value. It's likely going to have a huge appreciation in dollar terms at some point in the future. Uh, I really do believe there's about 30 or 40 percent 
of the world looking for an alternative to the dollar. If you look at the United States from the rest of the world, it's not too pretty. The Donald's going to claim he won the election, whether he won it or not. There's a lot of issues in the United States. A lot of people just say we're not buying into that anymore. The United States debt is, we got 30 trillion of official debt, plus or minus the United States, probably 100 trillion with unfunded pension liabilities. There's no, there's no way that car workers in Detroit are going to lead the electrification of the automobile. So anything real input into the economy that we need is going to go up in dollar terms. And by the way, the price of oil could go to 300 as well, and you need that to mine gold. Anything real could go to moon. Copper can go up, oil can go up, gold can go up. It's the dollar. The dollar is clearly politicians. You know that politicians are somebody that bribes you with your own money. This is called Bidenomics. Like, they're just printing money. They, and it, it, it's, it's, it's clearly going to end badly. And by the way, when you speak about the dollar as the only alternative, there, there was a Roman currency, and that came to an end. So over time, it's not forever. It's impossible that the dollar will be the source of value forever. It might be the source of value for 30 more years. But on this little planet, clearly, um, we've had a period of quiescence. And I just want to tell everybody, like, gold's gone from what? 300 to 1900, that's nothing. And we've seen molybdenum go from a dollar a pound to $30 a pound. And we've seen NVIDIA just go to infinity, trillions of dollars. The, the problem for the gold miners is this um, tyranny of net present value. The equity should be much more valuable, but people still apply a net present value model. Uh, I don't think China really applies a net present value model. And I think with the rise of India, they won't use net present value models. If you've got a billion people to feed, you need the inputs, and you're the high bidder. So China has been the high bidder for everything in the electrification of the automobile. The whole supply chain of metals required to achieve that, uh, the high bidder has been China. And now the West has woken up very much on the back foot. And as a consequence, we're printing all this money, aren't we? The politicians are bribing you with your own money. So it just feels intuitive to me, like eventually the bridge fails and you do get a much higher metals price denominated in dollars. We keep forgetting that it's the measuring stick. If you live in Japan, the gold price just went up 40% in the last nine months. That's a pretty big economy, by the way. It's the third largest economy in the world. So you remember the Fed told you that inflation was uh, not happening or it was transitory. And now we've got a trillion dollars a year in interest costs. You think they could really pull a Volcker and drive U.S. rates to 20% to rescue the dollar? I don't think so. I think we're quite near the top in interest rates for the dollar. Maybe one or two more bullets, but in an election year, Sleepy Joe will be gone. They'll break the economy. So I think it's, you know, it's not bad to have a little bit of your money in the barbaric relic. Not a bad speculation. Pierre, Frank, anything? Well, your question was about central bank digital currencies <laughs> and what they mean to us. <laughs> Sorry, he went off on a tangent. But um, <laughs> no, my only concern with central bank digital currencies is one of freedom. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian of sorts, so I don't like the idea that a central bank is going to control everybody's wallet and, to, and have the ability, if they cho chose to do so, to either punish you or reward you for your spending habits, uh, in all in the name of fine-tuning the economy, uh, which is what they will do. Um, and it will allow them to have negative interest rates, to do whatever they want at that stage, and they'll force you into spending habits that you may not necessarily want to adhere to. So uh, that, that part worries me, is that once central bank digital currencies are in place and they become universal, we're going to have a loss of freedom. And my question to um, you in the audience, when was the last time that you actually used cash for a transaction? Like, when was but, the last but, time? But the difference is, Pierre, I, I know what you're getting at, but I still have the choice to use cash, right? On a central bank digital currency, that's gone. That is correct. And there will have to be an alternative to the central bank currency. But I don't think that there is any doubt that that's where the world is going. We're going digital, whether we like it or not. The, the, the cash is going to disappear. And it's going to take another form, 
which possibly when I referred to earlier at uh, ETF, gold ETF 2.0, this could be another form of cash that will be outside of the banking system. So I'm able to pay people with gold via yep. this? Yep. Yeah. And that would be, you know, a, a, it'd be a digital currency, a blockchain. Uh, you can transfer anywhere in the world. And it's, you know, the, the record only, there's only the, uh, you have the record not the central banks. And that will be the alternative. I think that could be the, an alternative currency to central bank digital. But are they going there? Absolutely, 100% it's going to happen. And I guess that raises the broader question of how do you bring awareness to gold, right? Because I didn't want to bring up the B word, but Bitcoin, Frank. I look at you because what's your question? You went on the international stage when you battled Michael Saylor, right? And people call me now. To, when would we do that? Two years ago, and say Frank won that. Frank won that debate. Um, before we would blame Bitcoin for oh, this is why there's not interest in the gold market and whatnot. But with the current crypto winter, I mean, should that not be helping gold again? Well, I think it already is in that, you know, a lot of that Bitcoin crypto hype was based on a premise that gold was an ancient barbaric relic that uh, would soon have a zero value. And that's the reason I took on Sailor, because he was saying that gold was going to go to zero, Bitcoin was going to go to a million, everybody should sell everything and buy it. Listen, the whole Bitcoin thing, in my opinion, and I, I would advance apologies to any Bitcoin holders in the audience, <laughs> is that... It was a momentum play for all the big players, and they've exited. So now it's a retail play. It's an asset in search of a purpose, in my opinion. They've talked about many different purposes for Bitcoin. And I think that eventually, if all of these central bank digital currencies come into play, they will, like China, they will attack Bitcoin. And it's not going to be that hard to attack. And, you know, they can attack the on and off ramps. And all the, then you've got a bunch of code sitting in your wallet. What are you going to do with it? Um, and so I think they will, you know, that's why I believe gold is the store of value. Because even if they try and come for your gold, it's not going to be as easy to get if, if they want to eliminate Bitcoin trading. That's going to be very easy to do. So that's my only concern about Bitcoin. If you want to buy it and speculate, knock yourself out. But as a store of value, it's a little bit more than a decade old. doesn't mean anything to me. Pierre, I want to talk, well, I want to talk with all of you about the state of mining now. Um, I know we've had conversations about permitting and how, how difficult it is to permit in various jurisdictions. But your view on, I mean, look, with 1900 gold, I mean, this should be a healthy environment. But what, what, what's, what's your take on, on mining? Um, the, the permitting is, as we all know, is getting more and more difficult. Um, I was in Nevada like a couple of days ago, and uh, three weeks ago, Nevada, unilaterally, the BLM added one year to permitting. Uh, if you look at Barrick Gold Rush, they've been waiting four years now to uh, get a record of decision. Still don't have a record of decision. Um, and it's not just, and that's Nevada, which is like ranked the number one jurisdiction in the world. So you look every, everywhere else, it's getting a real, a real issue. And um, I think where I see this going is if you remember the, the Lausanne curve, like, you know, you have this uh, big spike at the first and then, you know, it uh, goes back down. And that section is getting stretched out to two, three, four, five, six years. And it's becoming the killing fields because the juniors are not going to be able to get through that section. And you're going to end up where the, the, the real money is going to be made is going to be the intermediate and the senior that already have production. Because even if the gold price goes to, you know, 3,000, the market is not, the, the producer are not going to respond fast enough. It's going to take 10 years for them to increase production. So you're just going to have even more demand. So that, that's the reality, I think, that we're facing in the, the industry. Uh, a gloomy outlook for the juniors, Pierre. The juniors will be fireflies. Fireflies. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they're going to have a discovery and then they're going to disappear. It's going to be really, really difficult to finance any juniors over a long period of time unless they have a very strong 
backer, a, you know, someone uh, or an organization or a, a, a fund, a family office that is there to support them. Interesting point you're bringing up here. Frank, Robert, I'm interested to know if you agree with what Pierre's saying. Yeah, I do to a certain extent, but I, I, I believe that we're suffering sentiment right now, and the sentiment is as bad as it's ever been in terms of this sector. I think if gold breaks through, Pierre, the old highs and stays there, you know, finds a new level, I think the sentiment will come back into the juniors. It's like everything else. When, when you and I had this conversation in 2001, and let me remind you, we were sitting at the King Edward Hotel in Toronto. I was trying to talk you into creating what was eventually going to be Wheaton River. And I, I was saying gold was 250 an ounce. And I said, and I had a thesis that gold was going to go higher. And I said, Pierre, it's going higher. And you said, Frank, you've been out of the business too long. It's t terrible out there. It'll never happen. That's what you're fighting. In, like, even us industry people are getting discouraged. And I think you have to step away and watch what's happening from the outside, look, look in. It's, it's a sentiment thing, because there's real value there, and eventually it will be discovered. Eventually. Robert, anything to add on the state of mind? I don't know, I've been listening to all this. Um, first of all, cryptocurrency, totally absurd. Um, the superpowers have developed electromagnetic pulse weaponry. You're sitting in New York or London, missile goes overhead, it goes pfft. There's no blast, there's no heat, there's no light, and everything electrical is wiped out. So you won't be able to access your bitcoins. There's no safety in that at all. Technology can just wipe that out in a moment's notice. So electromagnetic pulse weaponry is critical. It's just exactly what's happening in the, in the war in Ukraine. Do you really think Ukraine sank the Moskva? All conventional military equipment is now obsolete. It's fought with drones. So gold can't be wiped out with an electromagnetic pulse. It's clearly a, an asset. Crude oil is still an asset until we get rid of it. Copper is an asset. So with all this money printing, real things are definitely coming back in style. I don't know if I look like an insect, you guys, but I've got these big antenna with little balls on the end. They're very sensitive. There's oceans of money looking for real things right now. There's no shortage of that. So this whole thing with, with crypto, I completely agree with Frank. Like, it's much more fragile. People think that a distributed ledger can't be wiped out. A distributed ledger can be immediately wiped out. If you, if you bury some gold, you know, under a tree in your backyard and you remember where you buried it, you have an asset, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. Like, the idea of uh, squeezing the last marginal Bitcoin and generating astronomic amounts of global warming gas you know, it's just, it's just existentially absurd. Most of the gold in the world has already been mined. The carbon budget for funding it already happened. The mining industry only adds a tiny bit of gold to what's already been mined. So that store of value exists. I'd just like to give you an idea, think about copper. Uh, the United States electrical grid has 150 million tons of copper in the grid. It's sunk, it's in the grid, it's what's turning these lights on. If you want to rip that 150 million tons out of the grid, we'd freeze in the dark. The gold has already been mined. It's in Central Reserve Bank vaults. And it's very likely to appreciate against any kind of fiat currency. And it'll do a better job in the end than crypto. Crypto is a solution that's still looking for a problem. What about oil? Who's um, bullish? I'm very, very bullish. When you think of oil, you think energy is life. It took Mother Nature 500 million years to create all the hydrocarbon that we have. And what we're doing is we're putting straws, we're sucking it up, and we're selling it for the price that we're sucking it. And we, human, are going to burn all of that in 200 years. And 120 have already gone by. So we got about 80 years left to figure out a way to produce energy that will, that will continue life as we know it today. So when I look at all the major oil basins of the world, including, including Gawar in Saudi Arabia and including the Permian Basin in the US, probably the two largest basin, they're well past their peak. They're all on the down cycle. And the um, 
environmentalists have put so much pressure on the oil companies not to increase production, and yet the demand for energy continue to increase every year, and it will continue to increase for the next 100 years, because energy is life. So when I look at that, I think we're in a situation like 1976 to 1980, when the oil price went up every year, the inflation went up every year, and guess what? The gold price went up every year. And wow. I, I look at the next few years, and I'm very bullish. Uh, finally, I'm in violent agreement with uh, Pierre, which means I'll beat could, up anybody. Hey, guys, can I, can I bring this. this back to gold, please? You know, um, <laughs> and Leave it to you to conjure up some rhetorical alchemy to turn a gold conversation to one about copper. But it, you talked about it took 500 million years to uh, create all of the hydrocarbons. It took the collision of two neutron stars to create the element we call gold. It's uh, through a process called uh, rapid neutron capture. It requires that amount of, of heat, pressure, and density. Two neutron stars, and that doesn't happen very often. That's probably not going to happen in my lifetime again. <laughs> All right. Uh, ooh, we're running out of time. We're speaking ahead of the FOMC. You mentioned inflation. Is high inflation here to stay? The Fed remains hawkish. We'll see whether they, they raise rates or not again. But is this high inflation here to stay? I, I, I wouldn't say high inflation, but I think the inflation level is going to be higher than the Fed would like. Um, you know, the UAW is on strike right now. They're going to get probably uh, a much higher uh, settlement than the, the auto uh, manufacturers would like. I mean, I'm looking at inflation rate staying in the 4% for the next uh, five years. And with uh, oil price going up, it could get up to 5%. And the Fed is in a box because if they keep raising interest rate, they're going to dive the economy. And it's the same in Europe. They're all in a box. And so the real rate of interest is actually, um, you know, going to increase. Yeah. And I, that's favor goals. But talk, that's what happened in the 70s. Talks of recession have, have calmed down. I mean, we started the year, oh, we're going to have a recession for sure. Now even Goldman Sachs saying not so much. I mean, Frank, your take on, 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 on what the Fed will do next here? <laughs> well, I think the Fed is going to continue to posture that they will keep rates at an elevated level for as long as it takes to tame inflation. I, believe, I agree with Pierre. I think we're going to be in a long period of elevated inflation, and I agree around the 4 or 5% level. Um, but here's the problem. You've got $7.6 trillion of treasuries, U.S. treasuries, maturing in, in one year. You know, you're going to refinance at 5%. I mean, pretty soon, if, this, if they keep these rates at these, at these levels, the, uh, the uh, interest uh, expense will be like $1.5 trillion. And that's just, you can't, it's unsustainable. It's impossible. They're going to break something. They'll break the U.S. banking system. They'll break the commercial real estate market. Something's going to break. The Fed wants inflation. If they inflation. keep these rates. The Fed wants okay. inflation. The Fed wants inflation. Real inflation is now, if you, if you can't cure the fever, you monkey with the thermometer. I don't know if an intelligent person who thinks inflation is really 4 or 5%. The things you really want to buy are 10% inflated all over the world. And we're in the strongest currency, the dollar, at the moment. There's an ocean of it. We're breaking down the global supply chain. It's highly inflationary. We had a nice integrated world economy until yeah. about 2008. And the Donald slapped those tariffs on Chinese goods. The Democrats left those tariffs there. So as we break down our integrated world economy, we're hostage to $300 crude oil before we get there. Huge amounts of inflation. And your favorite grandmother, Janet Yellen, can't do anything about it. She said that it was transitory. So, so if, if, if inflation is your reason to buy gold, which has historically been a good reason, uh, it's real, and it's not going away. I have to wrap this panel, but you know what? I want to give a gift here. With the less than two minutes we have left, can each of you tell me something that is close to your heart that you're working on, a project we should be paying attention to? Robert. We're working on a new way to use electrical energy. We have a new way to crush and grind rock with a massive reduction in energy. And we're going to charge the gold miners a royalty on every unit of their rock they crush. We got BHP in there. We got Bill Gates in that technology and the European economic community because we need a greener way to mine. 
you know. And so the gold has already been mined. The mining industry is only adding a percent or something every year to the gold supply. But for the things we need, like uh, electric metals, we need a better way to mine, and that means we need a better way to use electrical energy. So that's where we're putting our efforts. I'm a little bit more simple. I just want to build a couple of great mining, gold mining companies. Um, done it a few times over the last 20 years, and we're doing it again with uh, Eris and West Red Lake. Uh, I want to get those up to multi hundreds of thousands of ounces of production, and that's how I make my money, and it's fun. Um, I be, I, I've got a bit of a... Um dilemma between uh, gold and coal, but apart from that, life is good. <laughs> um, a bit like Frank, I think uh, a couple, a few years ago, I helped start a company called Orla, which is uh, you know fast becoming an intermediate company. Uh, I love the discovery cycle. I, I'm involved with a company called Southern Cross, which just put out a whole 400 meters of five gram. I mean, that like fabulous stuff. I love that. The best drill hole I've ever been um, associated with was a thousand feet of one ounce uh, when we discovered Gold Strike. Uh, and I'm looking for another one of those. So. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Robert Friedland, Frank Joustra, Pierre Lasson, what an honor to moderate this. I hope uh, we covered as much as we could in the very short time we had allotted. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.